as I was sitting um, in the audience listening to your, your um, presentations, I have to admit that I felt, um, I had this moment thinking, oh God, we're just beginning. This is just the first panel, and it's, you know, there's so many rich questions, and, and I was realizing, oh, we're, we're only getting started. Um, so I, I first of all have to thank you all for uh, really fantastic and compelling um, papers. Um, I'm not going to ask many questions what, or, or questions at all. What I want to, to do instead is to actually draw some lines of connection. Um, because I think there were some really important lines of connection, and, and I'm doing this off the top of my head because I did not read the get the papers in advance. Um, but one of them, no, we didn't ask you to do that. Um, but one of, I want to start with um, one of the um, comments that, the questions that you posed, Nicole, in your, in your, the beginning of your presentation, which is to query um, to what extent vernacular is an appropriate term to use for practices in incarceration, right? So to actually think about what kinds of sovereignty is required to actually have a vernacular practice. Um, so I felt like that was a really important opening question to pose to get us to really think about what are the circumstances required to constitute a vernacular practice. Um, a second uh, question that I want to bring out um, is, is a, a, a line of thought that actually connected Lily and Ali's um, pieces, which is to actually think about the relationship of photography as producing certain subjects. So to produce a non-subject or to produce a particular kind of patriarchal subject. Right? So thinking about the relationship between the adoption of photography not to represent right, or to reflect something that already is, but to create certain uh, subject positions that, in Ali's case, um, do two things at once. <laughs> right? uh, to, to think about it um, constructing a, a form of traditional subject while at the same time using modernity and technology to produce that traditional subject and to sort of reinscribe the base of power that um, a notion of this technological intervention as supposedly disrupting, right? And in the same way, I, I, I was hearing you, Lily, saying that same thing, is that to what extent do we have to challenge the ways in which um, photography is only creating this dominant subject, but it's also creating these other, other forms. And again, another um, thread that I found um, was really compelling was the Lily's notion of capture and captivation both being um, contingent upon a notion of uh, entrapment and involuntary practices. And I feel like that is something that's the thread that's going through all of your papers is to really, again, come back to that question of what kinds of coercion <laughs> right, are constitutive of certain vernacular practices. Um, and then um, in the, the beautiful um, ending to a beautiful series of, of papers, to think about pensive photography in the words of Bach, um, and to twin that idea with a notion of examining photography's dirty work, which I love that phrase, um, to think about opacity as also a coerc coercive um, technology. Um, and to think about the ways in which assault allows, adding assault to the, the binary of the repressive and the honorific gets us back to, or gets us to a way of accounting for coercion in captivity within the shadow archive, which I think one of the things that all of you are bringing out is how, how present that absence is. <laughs> right? So those are just some lines of connection. I want to give you the opportunity to speak to one another, um, because I, I think you are speaking to each other, and then I'll open it up to a larger conversation. Uh, or because I, I, did I have Jamie's chair? Closer. Oh, uh, there we go. 
Uh, you know, Tina, thank you for that. And as I was listening to our papers, I was also reminded of the connections between this panel and yesterday's discussion, in particular Patricia's discussion or, or question, you know, is the photograph correct? Um, and the language of entrapment that you introduced into our discussion yesterday, which I actually meant to pick up on, now I get to. <laughs> um, uh, and also Ariella's discussion as well of, you know, the condition, you know, the, the ways in which these photographs demand an inquiry into the conditions of their production that remain almost invisible in all kinds of ways. And so uh, I, I think that you know, to think of the, the, the language of trap and entrapment, entrapment and, and the shutter opening and closing, you know, is to ask uh, a lot of questions around apparatus and around um, conditions that, I, I mean, I actually find it very interesting how this collection, um, you know, and again, my exposure to it is limited, aside from this point, um, doesn't, you know, sometimes when I'm given images to look at, I get way too much information. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with all of the information. And in this instance, I actually was, it was very liberating. Like, it was all, all very little. And, um, uh, and I, I, so I'm interested in how the absence or euphoria of, of information is also part of that coercion. So that, you know, when we say, come get your photograph taken, look over there. You know, it's it's actually a, it's not just a feint. It's also about uh, a, different kinds of either withholding or absence that are part of this um, process. Um, well, thank you very much, and I really enjoyed hearing from the other panelists. Um, I'm you know I am still struggling with how like you know how useful the concept of vernacular is for my research. And one of the things that I developed in my project. Um, is a concept called carceral aesthetics, and it's looking at the production of art and visual culture in, the, in conditions of unfreedom. And to say that um, art and photography about prison and prisoners are bound by what I developed as penal space, penal time, and penal matter. And the vernacular does make assumptions about time and space, but what does it mean, like as I say about one artist who spent 22 years in solitary confinement, I wouldn't call this work vernacular, it's the struggle with what does it mean to be in a box? How did, what's the duration of time in a box for 22 years? Um, and, you know, so I'm still, like, working through it, but I want, I, to me, it's bound by other frameworks. There's the kind of quotidian, there's a lot of boring, like, they're incarcerated people are often very bored. Um, there is a kind of routinization. I mean, there are things that I think we often associate with the idea of vernacular, but it's completely framed by conditions of unfreedom um, that I think it doesn't do justice to say we're all in states of unfreedom. It's a, it's a different kind of framework for understanding what it means to, to live in captivity, to exist in captivity, if, if you know. I think that um, this question of time and differential time is really important. Um, and the fate of the photograph that there's before and after of an image. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of um, Dwayne Reginald Batts' extraordinary essay that was just published in the New York Times two days ago, I think, or the day before yesterday. He is a recent graduate of Yale Law School, <coughs> and he's a poet and a writer, and he uh, is a felon and was incarcerated for many years. Um, and he's had to struggle getting uh, to be qualified to act as a lawyer, despite his immense achievement in passing the bar. And he's also decided to share this, and he's, it's, it's an amazing essay. But what, one of the things that struck me about it is that he says that the thing you learn to do in prison is to wait. The time in prison is, I'll wait till this bell rings, I'll wait till this comes, I'll wait till I get the letter, I'll wait till I hear the sound, I'll wait till... The prison is an extension of these repeated moments of waiting. And I will also say, and this is very impressionistic, but of the people that I've met who have had served long time in prison, there, 
it feels like there is a, a skill of waiting. I've noticed this. I have not know what the word, how to say it, but I've, I've often, or, or when I've had this experience, there's an ability to, of something about time. And uh, all at once, this of the photograph wants to fix that. It wants to collapse it. It wants that duration not to exist. It wants to solve it really quickly. We've got a crime, we've got a kid, we've got a problem. And the years in the trail of that do not resolve. And as Spets is very clear in saying, they do not ever resolve. But the photographic fix attempts to the photographic fix is an anxious relation to that extent of time, and that, that practice of time, that ability of, of time. So I, I think that we, um, yeah, that um, we do the dirty work that the photographs help us to do when we are conclusive that, that, that that's a kind of capture also. Um, and that somehow we have to learn that the all at onceness can dissolve. I don't, you know, and that and that we need to face the photograph with a different kind of time. That's what I'm thinking. Out of <coughs> photography, out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that um, let me. Um, I just want to come back to the sort of art historical aspect of all of this our discussion, um, and and ask uh, the question that Jeffrey asked yesterday: What do photographs do? I don't know. Maybe it was just because my own sort of background coming from looking at these images that I saw in these papers, I had a completely different readings of it. For example, um, in these images, the contrasting the. Uh, mock shots um, uh, of prisoners with lots of information, the Bertillon tram. I see that that more information actually was a way of reducing the subject, disciplining the subject, as opposed to providing us with, you know, necessarily a more liberatory or open possibility of reading those images. By contrast, I thought that the image of the farm workers actually is a project, if I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I think it was a project that actually tried to problematize precisely that tradition of photography by exposing how these people were actually in numbers. And the intention, the lack of information, the, the white awkward inclusion of background, which stuff showing on the side with a number, I think was an attempt um, you know, to, to kind of problem take that. At the same time, once we do the archival research or, or background research, it may be that this was a way for the farm owners to actually number them and have information on them. But visually speaking, those possibilities are always there. So the conditional possibility, the conditional production is very important so long as we do that. Similarly, for example, um, in, um, when I was listening to Nicole's pic pictures, those very moving pictures of your family, for me, what spoke most was about the desire for freedom in the back, um, backgrounds. And in this way, Chris Penny's images of Nagda are very interesting because that background really spoke to the profound desire of these subjects to get out of that place. For me, they were very moving and liberatory, precisely because they had they were posing in these awkward backgrounds that he knew they were artificial, that they knew they were not part of what they were going through. But that it was the pontoon for me. That's what got me to think of their suffering, the awkward background, and the awkward smiles. So in that way, the images to me were very oppositional, very oppositional in that way, not just capturing them. And with Laura's uh, images, as I was wa watching them, I was immediately reminded of the long tradition of um, um, amateur photography in the mid 19th century that was working against actually professional photographers. And the sparse background, the clothing, the lack of any kind of a prop 
what made the spirit image extremely powerful and what again what made me sort of see the suffering of these things was precisely the aesthetization the artistic quality of these images that gave amazing expression to their feelings to their, what was inside their suffering precisely because there was no props they were and it just the, 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 the face the eyes the awkward gazes in direction was the pontum that took me to their suffering in, in that way. So I think that in thinking about these images, there are two uh, things that we have to take into consideration. The condition of the production, obviously the background. These pictures are taken in prisons you know, or asylums. And at the same time, the kind of art historical tradition with which these images are engaged. And as such, they give us a different, I think, set of um, readings, as it were. Yeah, and I actually, I discussed the backdrop in detail in, in my writing, but what I think for me was more the question I'm asking right now around it is, what does everydayness mean when in the classic state? Yeah. You know, and, I, and what does it mean? I mean, it's not, the context of the prison, the backdrop, changes the, the structure of time. Um, and it changes the entire notion of belonging. Um, and it's much more connected to our history of NATO alienation and unfreedom. So I'm thinking through all that to, to think about, well, what, what, are the, what are the kind of analytic categories that we use to talk about these sets of images? So I want to take the opportunity to open it up. There's a question about the back, and then there's one down here. Do we have microphones that are circulating? There's one right at us. Hello? Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Jordan, I'm the convener of the Episcopal Peace Fellowship at St. Bartholomew's Church. Thank you to every single one of you. Um, Nicole, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit, if you can, on the gentleman who was in solitary confinement? Uh, since that's 23 hours a day, usually, was he allowed to use a a, a, a camera when he was out of solitary for that one hour a day and did he become a photographer after he was in solitary or before he was in solitary if you know thank you thank you for your question and just to clarify when I, I mentioned an artist who was in solitary confinement for um, 22 years his name is Ojuri Lutalo he's not a photographer he's part of my larger study of visual culture mass incarceration, but I, I'm so glad you asked that question because he has actually used his criminal index. He used his mugshot to make collages, and he had very little resources. He had basically butcher paper, um, pens and pencils, and his criminal indexes, or indices, and, he, and newspaper articles. So he created like hundreds of collages, re, kind of repeating these images over and over and would send them out to the Prison Watch program with the American Friends Service uh, Committee, and they use his collages in their um, advocacy work against solitary confinement. Um, and just to plug, he's actually going to be speaking in Philadelphia on November 2nd as part of a symposium I'm co-curating with um, the Mirror Arts Philadelphia. It's called Portraits of Justice. You can search it up, and it's an all-day free symposium with um, a lot of formerly incarcerated artists um, and activists on, on panels. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you so much for such a generative discussion uh, following on last night. So I have uh, so many questions, but I have a totally maybe trivial one for Ali. Uh, we were noticing the hands in the production of masculinity, why the hands were all um, sort of sitting on the legs or all showing all five <laughs> fingers like this. So I don't know what that has anything to do with anything, but it, uh, it's very striking in the pose and in the kind of production of masculine, of bourgeois masculinity that you outline. Uh, and then I have a larger question, so, um, but let me ask both of them. And really I wanted to follow up on Laura's discussion about fixing. 
Um, and I was a little bit surprised about how unforgiving the fixing appears in your discussion. Um, and I'm wondering what, um, why in some situation the fixing is so incredibly attractive and produces so much attention and affect, why we really prep, you know, really these images that are so fixed of our childhoods or our parents at certain moments become so precious precisely because they're fixed in a moment. And you know, we, you only have to read Bard to you know, kind of get the flavor of the affect that's attached to that. And why in some situation the fixing seems so unforgiving and cruel uh, and violent. Um, and also, I wonder if we do not need to complicate the idea of fixing if we ask the question of what the photograph does. Because the photograph isn't just the photograph, it's really it's the moment of its production and it's its afterlife. And at various moments, the photograph that may have been fixed at some moments does various different things. And we only have to think of Susan Micellas bringing photos back to think about you know, how they become unfixed uh, or they, maybe they're never uh, totally fixed. Um, so, you know, that, and then just as a third thing, to quickly say where I think we are with our discussion of the vernacular, I think we've introduced a number of terms here, and I just wanted to flag them. We have vernacular, we have ordinary, and we have everyday. Those seem to be, and maybe some others that are circulating. And I'm hoping we can multiply the terms to make the discussion more productive rather than just thinking, is this vernacular, is it not vernacular, which I don't find as productive as some of the other range of issues that have been discussed here. Just a quick response to your question. I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I think there are two, at least I've, I've, I make this, uh, thing, I, there are two arguments that you have sort of made, not arguments, observations. One is that the, the sort of the uh, the shutter speed being slower, that you had to sit stiff and put your hands, and that was part of the technology, and you saw there was some blurring because of the movements. But that's a technical term. I think that actually the hands are displayed in such prominent ways to emphasize the fact these are not working hands. This is before before the age of lotions and so on. Uh, if you uh, <laughs> if you worked. Uh, you with your hands, your hands will not be those nice, clean, straight, uh, you know, yes. hands. Absolutely. And that's, that's what you wanted to make sure. I'm not a working man, you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ariane, for your question. Um, I'm not sure it's unforgiving. I'm trying to get at something. Um, I, and there's a distinction that I'm thinking of, whether I was able to make it clearly or not, between the photograph as an object or an event, which um, <coughs> is, is not fixed in the ways that you say. Um, but the emergencies of the time, which the photograph <coughs> um, expresses, nothing is fixed. No, nothing, is, nothing is fixed. We, we are increasingly aware that nothing is fixed. And the ways that ordinary photographs have helped to comfort, helped to assuage anxiety, helped to make kinship, helped to make the ordinary, helped to make the everyday, all of that has another aspect to it, which is to comfort us from the ongoing emergency that the photograph is in, in uh, an expression of in some way. So I guess that, and, and so for me, the, the pictures of the men in the asylum, you know, they are there. They're always there. The photograph person is always there. And the insane person is always there. And that there's a gratuitous blow that, yes, they're very interesting pictures. And they, they're, you know, there's a lot of expression in them. But there's the deliberate, addition to make the men look crazier, look away, not not meet the gaze, not do what other people do. The deliberate, why do that? And at the same, one reason why do that is because you don't think that the men can, they don't know, they can't get revenge, they can't do anything to you, it's 
sheer sadism, it feels like to me. Um, why do that? What is because you don't know that the photographed person is always there. They're in there. And so that's an emergency, and it's an emergency about what to do with mentally ill people. It's an emergency. And it's not fixed. <laughs> and so I mean not fixed in that sense. And the remedy of the image in ordinary life is to, to have been able to say, oh look, we, we got it here. But in so many cases, we don't. So it's that that I'm talking about, things this, the, the, uh, rather than the other idea. Thank you. There's a question over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. This has already been provocative and enlightening. Um, I've got a comment on last night and tonight and today's uh, panel, and then a question really for today's panel and particularly for Nicole Fleetwood and Lily Cho. Um, the, I feel last night, which was a wonderful, I think every conference should begin with a fundamental questioning of the premise of the conference. Yeah. Um, there's something that is extremely productive uh, in that. The, it seems, though, that um, it, it may be worth flagging a blind spot in that questioning, and half of which was articulated, I think, perfectly by Clément Chirou. Um, the, uh, the, there's, to take a page out of you know, Prague uh, linguistics, uh, Prague school, uh, there's an unmarked and a marked term here. And it seems to me that, uh, as Clément uh, made clear, the unmarked term is art, and the marked term then becomes vernacular photography. So in the realm of, um, in the realm of everyday life, no one has, as Kimmel said, no one looks at their own you know, photo feeds or their own family album and will, describes it as vernacular photography. It's just photography. It's, in this sense, photography is unmarked. And in that sphere, art photography is marked art photography. Photography here is not that photography, at least no, certainly not last night. The, uh, we're at the Lenfest Center for the Arts. The Walter Collection is many things, but it's basically an art collection. Jeffrey Batchin can teach the most radical histories of photography, but all of his courses still are preceded with a three-letter code, A-R-T. And I teach in an art history department, so this is not a bad thing. It is just the institutional frame. In that frame, we never have to teach a course called art photography. We just call it photography most of which is understood in the context of art. In that world, when we deviate from the unmarked term, we mark a term and we mark it as vernacular photography. I think that's simply the distinction that was, the confusion last night was an unwillingness to just mark ourselves as speaking from and within the context of art, in which case vernacular photography is a vital and important term. You leave the context of art, Vernacular photography seems to me useless. Right? It just called photography. Um, the uh, the fault before is before you do that. Before you go to the next part of what you're saying, you do need to set up the premise that many of us do not work in the field of art. Right. And that neither do we work in the field of art, nor were we trained in the field of art or art history. Yes. And therefore. Um, we are operating outside of that fundamental framing. And so I just need to say that because as somebody who is trained as a historian, and as many of these people um, have also said, um, what you're saying doesn't quite make sense. I, I hear right. it. I, I hear it, and, and, and I'm aware of it. And, and I, I know there are many people in this room who are in that camp as well. There are many people who are probably still within the uh, structures and institutions of art, and all of us are in the Lenfest Center for the Arts. Uh, and many of us are here. Again, you, you create an exhibition for an art or art-related institution, and those vernacular photographs are going to be put in frames, because that's the only way they know to treat photographs. And that is true of, I think, all the you know, institutional photographs we saw, installation photographs we saw last night. There is a... So the question then would be, if we're outside completely of the world of photography, uh, I'm sorry, the world of art, do we need the term vernacular? And I'm not convinced, in that regard I agree with the criticism, I'm not convinced that 
it does much work. The, uh, I would say the fault is not in our terms here, but in our institutions. So my question is, if there's a vernacular, like what would vernacular then mean outside of the world of art? And here a good example is just what the term actually meant, which is vernacular as opposed to the lingua franca. The vernacular was the local language. The lingua franca was the international language to a certain extent, the larger language, the language that people who spoke different vernaculars could speak to each other. Dante wrote in the vernacular. Italian was the vernacular. No one would think Dante doesn't constitute art. So that, to me, is, I think, a more useful divide, or potentially a more protective one. And in that case, so there's my question for Nicole and for Lily. It seems to me today, no type of photograph speaks more to a lingua franca than the ID photograph. It is a photograph meant to be recognized all over the world in basically the same way. Prison photographs in the you know, southern US or in China are very similar to each other by design. They speak, I would argue, a lingua franca. Vernacular photographs might be other local forms of, say, prison or ID related photography. And I would just, I don't, I don't think that this is the best, I don't, I don't want to put this out here as the best and only way to think. I just want to throw out one alternative, and I think there are many, uh, for how we might think about vernacular and lingua franca, for example, or other ways to make vernacular a little bit more productive. But my specific question is the ID photographs, would those constitute, you've presented them as, as, as vernacular, but I wonder whether there can be a divide and say those are actually the lingua franca. And what then, if that's the case, what is the vernacular? What is the vernacular alternative? Or what are the lingua francas that exist in the realm of photography that would make vernaculars once again potent? I'll respond briefly because I know there are some people in the audience who also have a lot to say. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would want to, I think one, one of the things I really want to animate in all of my current research is the idea of the ID photograph as a site of capture and captivity and then to rethink that. And so when you say lingua franca, there, to go back to Marianne's question, I think that when I think about the identification photograph and its relationship to the vernacular, it is, yes, every day in the sense that my students and those of us who get our driver's license, whatever, you know, when you go to the O&B, when you get your ID photograph taken, you don't necessarily think of its relationship to the migrant series, <laughs> of course. But what I want to do, I think, is in, in terms of the, the, the term vernacular, um, is to reanimate you know, the technologies of identification with the kinds of very problematic um, <coughs> historical underpinnings of vernacular that we are exploring here, you know, yesterday and today. Oh, so, sorry, to be clear, I did not say that uh, mugshots are vernacular photographs. I was looking at uh, the artwork that I've been archiving and writing about. And, and I said, in the past, I've described some of that as vernacular, but I'm not sure if that's an appropriate category for me to use to talk about work, so I use pretty much space time and matter. I'm so happy to be here. I'm not invested in the category vernacular. I think it's a fun <laughs> word, but I'm not, I'm not gonna go to blows over that at all. But what I do want to say, like two points, because I, you know, we all were, you know, working within frameworks of 15 minutes, but there were two points that I really wanted to make, and I'm not sure if I really, you know, if I was able to get to them. And one is um, that every photograph of an incarcerated person. This this concerns me more than whether it's what what cat how we frame it. Like it's you know it's a it's an ethical inquiry because it's a, it's a it's a photograph of a person who cannot consent. It's a photograph of a person who exists in a state of unfreedom, whether they have the camera or not. And so for me, every image I look at, every all my project, my whole project is grappling with my position of power, also just looking at these images, working with these images, and also then thinking about the culture and institutions of display. And, and I think often when we talk about vernacular, we talk about images that were not intent, originally intended for Sites display in, in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, so, 
I end, I rush through my ending with my cousins, Alan and DeAndre, coming to this exhibit at the Cleveland Public Library that I co-curated with Aperture Foundation. And for them seeing for the first time since they've been out of prison, a vitrine with dozens of images that they've sent to me during their time incarcerated. And these, and when I write about these images, I say how important they are as haptic objects. We touch them, we hold them, we cry them. And they're in this case, they can't touch them. They haven't seen these images since, you know, they were all, they were, they were shaken up by them. They knew they were going to be there, but they were visibly disturbed by it. And as we were leaving, Alan said, aren't we going to take those images with us? And I said, no, they're on display until Martin Luther King Day. And I said, are you okay with that? And I'm not sure 100% that he was okay with that, but he actually thought we were going to take those images home with us. So I'm, these are all issues. For me, I'm thinking about consent and display. So I just want to also follow up with two other points, which is why don't do we also have to assume that these images will necessarily be on display, um, that they will be framed um, without individuals like Arthur Walter? Right? So before they were in the collection, they were not framed. Um, they were in heaps. So I think we need to, to, to disturb that assumption. Um, I also think that we, we need to consider the fact that the ling whose lingua franca are we talking about, right? And that was really part of Lily and Ali's point in terms of thinking about the technologies of production is that the only reason that they are a lingua franca is because they are required and compelled, right? So that lingua franca is an imposed lingua franca. So even within that notion of what the vernacular might be, we also have to consider that. But I also want to invite them. one final, did you have one final comment? I mean, you did have a, a okay. She's not, she doesn't want to be the final, she says. But she has the microphone. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you really for a wonderful panel. And uh, I have a very brief question to Ali, and I have a comment to continue, Mariana and uh, the others. My very brief question to you, Ali, is you spoke about that uh, uh, they wanted to shield uh, the women from the camera, and the image that you showed us, they are not shielded from the camera. They have to be shielded from those who erase their images. So uh, just if you can re relate to it, and also in the other image that you showed, uh, and this will lead me to the general comment, what we saw is the men are uh, uh, really uh, footing on an image of a woman in the uh, rug, in the carpet underneath. And this carpet doesn't seem like to be at home, seems like to be in the photographer's studio. So if you can relate a little bit about, you know, really <laughs> to the image of the women and uh, the idea of shielding them. And my general comment or my general question or, let's say, desire to continue the conversation with you uh, uh, relates uh, also to what Marianne just said, uh, that rather than vernacular, yes or not, you mentioned several other uh, terms, ordinary, everyday, etc., which pertains to the photographs. But I would like to emphasize or to foreground for what you said as a common thread that these are the terms that can pertain to the photographs, but what you are all struggling with is the relationship between the photographs that can be qualified with this or that term and the world in which these photographs exist. And I think that maybe this uneasiness uh, 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 that Nicole expressed and others about the term vernacular, it's not something against the term, it's against delineating the photographs from the world. As Laura just spoke about, you know, uh, 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 the photograph person was always there, or the fix that is never completely fixed, but there is a, 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 something about the apparatus that fixes uh, uh, while the photographs are delivered as the objects of our uh, uh, inquiry. And I wanted maybe to ask you also, Laura, something about that uh, bring us to the, this tension between the photograph as the fixed object and the event of photography, which is this temporality where consent or the lack of consent, the unfreedom, constitute the situation. I, I found it brilliant the way that you identified, Laura, the, uh, the, the production of the distracted gaze. 
But I'm wondering, this distracted gaze, this looking you know, outside of the frame, is also in other circumstances a sign of someone who is visionary. So it is more, not only in the opposition of be, having this interiority and being forced to be distracted, but it is also always the right to look outside of the uh, frame or outside of this captivity to uh, go back to Lily's t uh, tension. So I think that what is on the table since yesterday evening is between those who are willing to limit the conversation between art vernacular as if we were all trained you know, uh, as part of the art world, and we were not, as Tina <laughs> said very eloquently for all of us, uh, to distinguish from all of you. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the question is, how we continue to use our skills and knowledge and uh, privileges to have access to the, all these corpus of photography in order to continue to think about the world in which these photographs are threatened to be another vehicle that will reproduce imperialism under its own terms. And we are struggling to little bit undo imperialism and racial capitalism terms, little bit, slightly, in the margin. So I'm going to ask um, for the panel to, to say some final comments, because I, I, I have a hard stop, which is that our videographer has to leave in 10 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick um, response to your question, uh, Maria. The, the photographs uh, were always viewed as public in a sense. I mean, in fact, part of what I was trying to say is that the, va the value of the photography was to show off, right? So in that way, there was always the possibility of these images getting elsewhere, and hence you did not take pictures of women, or if you did, you, uh, at least in this context, they, they got rid of them some, somehow. I'm not sure if I saw. The, uh, I'm not sure which image you're talking about. Yeah, but later on we can we can see that. But yes, it's kind of interesting. The carpet actually. Uh, you, you want to read how much you want to read into it, but you know that's something that is women's work, right? The carpet is produced not by men in Iran, but by women. Women. Who, what's that? Purchased by men and produced by women. So. I'll just be very brief. I, I mean, I think absolutely, you know, the, 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 one of the things that, that, that is, a, so absolutely, yes, Ariel, I'm just a little bit trying to undo, you know, the violences of colonial production that, uh, that, that attend to most of the images that we're working with. And one of the, you know, one of the things that I'm struggling with as I'm listening to our conversation is, you know, I spent the last 10 years looking at identification photographs of migrant workers who didn't want to be where they were and have to be tracked. And they're profoundly moving images, which is why I devoted so much of my time to them. Um, they're collected by Library and Archives Canada. They're not considered art. Um, most people who work anywhere near this material are historians who just think of them as historical documents. And so, you know, for me, it's been a struggle to say, no, they're portraits. You know, they're really, really, like there's photographic stuff happening here. Um, and what's interesting about this conversation is the other thing where I feel like, you know, here we have a market series. Uh, you know, series of migrant, uh, photos of migrant workers, and by by sheer dint of having been collected, <laughs> right, they've become art. And uh, you know, so whoever's going to write on these doesn't even have to say, "Oh no, they're really art." <laughs> um, um, and, and out of that, there's a whole set of conversations that we have to have then about work and labor, the the work of colonial expansion, right? And so that is the contrast with the G and G uh, precision workers employee cards, which. You know, it conscript this the the citizen into the steel making labor of the nation. Right? It seems to me that that's a profoundly interesting um, juxtaposition within the collection itself. Um, so I at first I that's what I thought that it's this saint's image or that it's comparable to the Charcot photographs, of, um, but in looking at them and in trying to reconstruct the situation in which that's produced, I, I actually don't think so. I, I don't have anything more to say except that I think we probably need a genealogy of photographs that would be insane. And I don't know that anybody has really done it. Uh, people have written, but um, I don't know that we've got, we have looked at that particular way of archiving. Um, and so it's making, but also about the fixity, some of you know I've spent the past several years working with Frederick Douglass's
theory of photography, and I really think that Douglas is a very important theorist of photography. So John Stover and Celeste Marie Bernier and Zoe Trotta published a magnificent book of, um, it's actually John's collection over many years of all the images of Douglas that he could find. And we've been told by them that Douglas is the most photographed famous man of the 19th century. That's really interesting. And um, their conclusion in looking at the array of photographs that Douglas, of Douglas that they have found, and truly there must be many more out there, um, is that Douglas, as a self-made man, keeps remaking himself over time in the photographs. But when I look at that body of images, I see a perdurance of a, a determination to present himself to a machine that he knows very well and I mean the slave power transmission, that he knows very well what kind of damage it can do. And he's doing this amidst things like the Agassiz photographs. He's doing this, he's insisting on it for four decades. And that, I think, is a struggle similar to the struggle, I'm thinking of it metaphorically, but with Covey, you know, his battle, in which the, he holds the throat of the overseer for what he says is ours. And that shows up in all of the autobiographies. There's a, there, he wants to get photography by the throat. Why? And if indeed this sort of little echo of a sound that the vernacular says slave is right, that's an interesting conjuncture. I believe that Douglas knows things about the photograph and is trying to do things about the photograph that we need to pay attention to. It's not fixed. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have to say that I'm, I, I'm not interested in reproducing the divide between vernacular and art, or vernacular photographs and art photographs. I, in fact, I think I'm interested in the, how they are entangled and um, so with the set of images of posing with my incarcerated relatives, I've been trying to think about how those images and other such images move through different environments. So when Dina Lawson shows a similar set of photographs, her name is attached to it as the artist, and it's art. And then when Sable takes her family photographs and, and cuts them up and displays them in a certain kind of way, her name again is attached to them. And it's art. And that's not a critique. It's uh, for me. It's just, I'm very interested in how 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 these images are moving, um, and you know, and with it's impossible to track the names of the incarcerated photographers who document these who photograph um, these visits. So that's I look at that in my in my project, and I, I just say that because I hear this kind of divide that's maybe part of a conversation yesterday, I was in here yesterday. I'm not, not interested in doing that. And when I was collaborating with um, Aperture, it was also very interesting because at, there were some really productive tensions happening as we were choosing artists, phot photographers, and photo projects to include um, in the special issue. And it's, you know, Aperture is used to working with photographers and their name being kind of centered on on these uh, portfolios and, you know, and my work with incarcerated, you know, this kind of archive of images of incarcerated people is really about trying to create a kind of a complex picture about, of the people who are incarcerated. Um, so it was a really interesting intention, I'm just saying, as we were working together on this, and I think, and hopefully, um, we resolved it in some interesting ways. I'm sure you did. Please join me in thanking the panel.